We seem to talk a lot about the sort of existential risks that we face here on planet Earth, asteroids, the robot uprising, biological contamination, nuclear war, etc. But one of the ones that I consider to be an actual threat that makes me a little nervous is the possibility of a powerful solar storm hitting the Earth. And we know through tree records that there have been fairly significant solar storms hitting planet Earth. And so I wanted to talk to a researcher who has been working on this. And so this is Dr. Benjamin Pope. He is an astronomer working at the University of Queensland. And he was part of a team that studied a bunch of fairly famous tree ring events. There's six over the last 10,000 years that indicate that some very powerful radiation storm hit the Earth. Astronomers aren't entirely sure what the cause was, but they think it was some kind of a solar storm, the most recent of which or the most powerful of which seems to be about 80 times more powerful than the Carrington event. This is, of course, that very famous radiation storm that hit the Earth back in the 1800s, lit the telegraph poles on fire, people saw auroras at the equator. It was a pretty bad day. So Benjamin and I talk about the research that they've been working on, what are the possible causes of these radiation storms, and then how we can search for other threats out there in the universe. So it's a fascinating conversation. I'll warn you the audio quality isn't terrific. He was in a fairly hollow room with a bad microphone. But I promise you the content of what he had to say was gripping. So enjoy the interview. Hi, Benjamin. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me today. I really appreciate it. Hi, Fraser. It's good to talk to you. So where are you right now? So I'm actually currently uh, in a visitor's office at the University of Sydney, uh, but I'm, I'm at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, in Australia. I was yeah. there in yeah. 20, I feel like 19, about three years ago, four years ago. And I was there speaking at a conference. Yeah. And it was amazing. I, I really liked it up in that, that part. I mean, we started in... Uh, Oh, like just south of Brisbane, and then my wife and I took a drive up the up the coast, all the way up to Mackay, and it was we saw platypuses, and oh, it was so great. You know, and I've never seen a platypus in the wild. Oh, really? Okay, well, oh, you go. Know. I've seen most of the other, you know, or some Australian mammals, but uh, platypuses are a little bit hard to find. That was the only one that we saw. Oh, I didn't see any of the yeah. other fame. Well, we saw kangaroos and and wallabies, but I didn't see. You know, yeah. like, we did keep our eyes peeled. For, for other ones, but that's that's what we saw. Um, all right, so so in so the, the the big piece of news that we've been reporting, and a lot of people have been reporting, is that you are part of a team that has been studying tree rings, and you have seen evidence of some interesting radiation storms that have hit the Earth in the past. So so let's sort of set the stage. So I guess the first thing is like, why are tree rings a great way of studying understanding the radiation environment around the earth historically yeah no so tree rings are this amazing uh record you know i like to use a lot of telescopes you know i've got data coming from james Webb space telescope it's a pretty big telescope we use the very large telescope but using all of the earth's forests as a telescope is, is really something even bigger than that um so trees have this annual growth season right you know we all we all you know anytime you see a nice hardwood table you see you know the tree rings that they lay down once a year um, and you can date these very precisely because if you take a tree today, you can just take a core through it or take a cut of it and, and count back the tree rings to the year in which it started growing, right? But what's also cool is you can date them going back thousands of years in archaeological samples because two trees of the same species in the same region um, tend to have good years and bad years at the same time. And so you get a pattern of thick and thin rings which is characteristic of the species in the region. And so if you've got a tree that's 300-year-old today and you chop it down, right, it's got 300 tree rings. But then you find an old building with another tree of the same species in it, and you find that the pattern of long and short years is like a barcode that overlaps the end of the tree's life and the you know, first of this tree's life. So now you can go, okay, well, we we're going to register these against each other. These are the same years. Now we can go back 500 years, say. And so... People who work in the field of dendrochronology, dendro tree chronology timing, dendrochronologists can go back uh, all the way to the last ice age in some species 
with these libraries of tree rings, which were all overlapping registered tree rings of, you know, this barcode pattern of good and bad years. That's amazing. Really like, there there must be know. people whose only job it is to oh, keep yeah. looking for new sources of trees, add them oh, to the yeah. library, overlap them, there, check and double check. Like people look in old buildings, uh, archaeological sites. One of the big ones is bogs. And it's quite funny. Like, so I visited, um, in Australia, it, it's quite interesting. Um, unlike the US, um, nuclear technology is very, very regulated. So we have one national laboratory, which is a really big national laboratory in South Sydney, which is the only place that's allowed to have active nuclear reactors. And it's got a bunch of really cutting-edge tech, but that's the only place in Australia you can have it. So it's this huge campus called ANSTRO, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. And it's got one of the most sensitive instruments in the world for, as I'll talk about in a second, um, measuring carbon-14 content of material. Um, and so I visited there to talk and talk to their team about what their data were looking like. And they said, do you want to hold a 12,000-year-old piece of tree? And I'm like, nah. I, absolutely do. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely do. Yes, please. Um, and it's been recovered from a bog in Tasmania. And so a lot of these really old trees are ones that have been preserved in bogs, right? And so he reaches into a drawer under his desk and he just hands to me this, this really beautiful big lump of wood and you can see all these beautiful tree rings in it. And I'm like, I, don't you want me to wear gloves? And he's like, it's been in a bog for 12,000 years. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. And they had like an entire two buildings, full warehouse-sized buildings with it must have been 20 labs in it where they do all of the wet chemistry processing to get um, really good samples. But what I'm about to talk about is, yeah. okay, yeah. get all these tree rings, right? And they go back 12,000 years or whatever. That's really good. Um, but how can we use them for astronomy, not just like climate stuff? You can easily see how growth patterns of trees will tell you that. But for astronomy, well, the reason is because um, you and I and every other living thing incorporates a small amount of radioactive carbon, radiocarbon, carbon-14, which is a radioactive isotope produced when you get both cosmic rays struck the Earth's atmosphere, these high-energy particles. They produce showers of particles. Now, the thermal neutrons in these showers uh, start nuclear reactions with nitrogen, which is like the main component of the Earth's atmosphere, uh, and they produce carbon-14, which is slightly radioactive. There's not a lot of it. There's only a few kilograms on the Earth, right? It's, it's, it's a really small fraction of the carbon on the Earth. Um, but sensitive instruments can measure it, and this is the basis of radiocarbon dating. Is what happens. It's produced up there, filters through the atmosphere, the oceans, plants and animals, you and me. Um, and so we are still like... You know, incorporating material from, from, from the air via typically eating plants, right? Uh, but when we die, we stop incorporating this new material. And so then it starts to radioactively decay. Right. And so basically a clock starts ticking when, when an organism dies. Uh, and if you, if you accurately measure the fraction of C14 in a sample, you can figure out its age, radiocarbon decay. Like this is a workforce of archaeology. People do this all the time. But the nice story they tell you, like in school or at university, when they, they tell you about radiocarbon dating, is there's always the same amount in in you know the atmosphere, which is the same amount as in plants and animals and you and me, right? Because it's been constantly replenished. Well, it's been replenished all the time, but not quite to the same amount every year. There's actually a fluctuation in the amount of radiocarbon that's produced every year, depending on the amount of cosmic rays that strike the atmosphere. And so um, this is a problem for archaeologists. Because there's something called a calibration curve where you actually need to know how much radiocarbon you started with in a particular year in order to figure out the age of, of a sample just based on C14. And so this is why people start looking at tree rings because you know exactly which year the tree ring was laid down. And so that's a record of the radiocarbon in that year. And so people started doing this with, where, where are you in the States? You're in the US, I'm right? in Canada. You're in, oh, you're in Canada. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm so embarrassed. Ne never ask a Canadian where they are in the States. I'm sorry. <laughs> it really <laughs> is the, the worst um, thing you can do. Uh, this interview has just gotten off on the wrong foot already, but know, we'll, 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 we'll tough through it. It's like asking a Kiwi if they're Australian. Yeah. They're really offended. Yeah. Because you wouldn't want to be associated with us. Um, and, uh, and I don't know if you'd like, always like to be associated with uh, them south of the border uh, in all contexts. Okay. Okay. So um, in California, you've got bristlecone pines, sometimes live for like 3,000 years or something. So the first calibration curves where they took a single bristlecone pine and they just measured the 
radiocarbon content of tree rings going back thousands of years. And you see it's been falling for a while, um, uh, a bit slowly, and but it also fluctuates a lot. Okay, so far so good. People did that 50 years ago. Well, um, in 2012, Fusumiyaki from Japan uh, got newly precise measurements of Japanese cedar, which is another of these great calibration curve standards, in order to, you know, look for this for archaeology and for cosmic ray history and stuff. And she was able to get single-year, very high-precision records, whereas previously people might uh, take chunks of tree, which were a whole decade's worth, and get one kind of okay measurement because they had older instruments. Now she had state-of-the-art modern stuff, and he saw a tick where 774 AD first she found this. There was a sudden spike of a couple of percent in, in the amount of radiocarbon in the tree. What the hell? Never seen this before. And pretty quickly her team and a couple of other teams um, found another five of these events uh, spanning 10,000 years. Um, so, so there's a total of six known now, actually a couple of unpublished ones that have mm. been presented in conferences. So there's probably eight or nine uh, that have been discovered over 10,000 years. So it's about once every 1,000 years these seem to happen. Uh, we get a sudden spike of radiocarbon production and then it drops away. And the reason it drops away is because it gets produced all at once, but then it gets filtered down into the oceans and see, you know, peat bogs and sediments and, and you and me and stuff like that. So it actually it goes into the whole Earth's carbon cycle, right? Now, this is where we come in. So these spikes of radiation, we don't know what causes them. Um, what you get is uh, you get a couple of years of the equivalent of, like, typical years production happens all at once. So it's, it's quite a big event. It's so, um, so it's several years worth of radiation is hitting the earth in a, in a moment. Yeah. Right. So it's, um, it is pretty significant. Various theories have been put forward as to what this is. Uh, for example, supernovae, right? Maybe supernovae could do this, gamma ray bursts. Well, um, my colleague Mike D, and I, who's a Kiwi guy, so he wouldn't want to be mistaken for an Australian. Um, uh, we, we met in the UK because we, we have a mutual love of coffee and cricket and, you know, various antipodean things. Um, we started talking about this and uh, Mike was able to get some data of tree rings going over the years of known historical supernovae, like the Crab supernova in 1054 AD or Kepler's supernova, Tycho supernova. We don't see anything, actually. There's, there's no radiocarbon associated with those. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean... It doesn't seem likely. And what? Uh, are, and uh, and I know so, there's no seemingly yeah. link between yeah. solar cycles. Well, this is where we're going. So um, the leading theory is that this is something from the sun. This is some kind of solar super flare. Have you heard of the Carrington event? Of course. Oh, I've done off all 1859, your, your telegraph pole yeah, set on fire. It was a huge deal, right? If yeah. the Carrington event today, which was the largest ever solar flare recorded, um, it would be disastrous for infrastructure. And it would take out all of our electricity grids at high latitudes, particularly in places like Canada. You, you're screwed. We might, I know. We might I know. We've already we went uh, through one back in yeah, the yeah. in the eighties. We went through one of these yeah. solar events yeah. in Quebec. And it was, much it was smaller, terrible. Yeah. 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 Um, so it would take out all the high latitude um, transformers, and transformers are very expensive to replace. And so that would be a real issue. Is, yeah. is it might it might take years to get everyone back online. Uh, high latitudes. It'd take out undersea internet cables and it'd take out satellites. So right. um, it's really bad. It's not the particles that do this. What happens is they hit the Earth's magnetosphere. They deform the magnetosphere. This this magnetic field of the Earth gets warped. And when you drive a magnetic field change through a loop of wire, that drives currents. So big long wires on the surface of the Earth are the things that that then get affected. And so this is like power grids. Um, it's not the radiation, it's the magnetic field change that gets you. Well, you think Carrington is bad. The particle flux associated with the 774 AD event was about 80 times bigger than Carrington. We don't know what did it. <laughs> right. But if it was a solar flare, it was 80 times bigger than Carrington. 80 times worse. And you don't well, see, yeah. like you can't find the Carrington event in these tree rings. Well, you don't see any evidence of Carrington, which is a bit disturbing, really. Um, yeah. It's too small to have a significant effect, whereas, whereas um, if the 774 AD, we call them Miyake events after their first discoverer, first Miyake, 
Um, if that was a solar super flare, it would be catastrophic beyond belief today. Mm -hmm. Like this would be a, a tremendous natural disaster. So one of the reasons I'm interested in studying these, right, is, okay, once a 1,000 years is a pretty low risk, but that's a 1% chance per decade. It's not the sort of thing that you want to lie awake at night thinking about all the time. It's the sort of thing that someone somewhere should figure out a plan about, right? Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's like if, you, if you'd seen lots of geological evidence of earthquakes but you'd never experienced one, right? You'd go, okay, these seem bad. We should probably figure out what the deal is before we build cities on the San Andreas Fault or whatever. Uh, even though we've never observed one in the modern era, there's all this evidence of landslides and fault lines and stuff. We've got to figure it out, right? It's not, not something to freak out about. I've got so many emails since we published this paper of just like, oh, my God, we're all doing it. No, 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 no. Like, <laughs> yeah, you got a 1,000 years on average. Yeah. Like, it, we're, we're not doomed. It's just it's important we figure out the details, yeah. figure out a plan for how to mitigate these things, predict these things, right? And so um, what I was interested in doing, right, was um, you get this, this curve where it's sharp rise and then a slow decay as a function of time. Of, of this C14 in tree rings. Now, that decay isn't radioactive decay. The shape of that curve is the C14 getting buried in, in sediments and getting locked into plants and animals and, um, uh, you know, going into the ocean, right? And so you've got to model the entire Earth's carbon cycle in order to model these time series. And so um, I'm not like a, a dendrochronologist. I'm not a tree expert, but we have Cambridge's leading dendrochronologist on our team, Orf Benkin. I'm not an archaeologist. I would love to be. I, you know, I always wanted to be when I was a kid, but you know, it's too much digging. You yeah, know, it's, it's dinosaurs or work. or space. Yeah, it's it's one or the yeah. other. But yeah, and so I went for space instead of archaeology. But Mike is an archaeologist at the University of Groningen. Um, he's he's uh, you know radiocarbon specialist, and so we've got him on the team, and we've got this guy Matthew Owens, uh, who's a solar physicist at, at the UK um, University of Reading, which is also where their net office is, so they they predict space weather. And, uh, and then a bunch of really bright students from the University of Queensland, um, Ching Wan Jan, Bukar Sharma, and uh, Jordan Dennis, joined as undergrads, so I was, really, I was really pleased. And we wanted to do, for the first time, a systematic statistical model of all existing tree ring data, nearly 100 trees, um, all showing evidence of these ticks over these different years, um, all six events, you know, going from 7,000 BC to, to 993 AD. We're going to systematically model the carbon cycle. There was no open source software for doing this at the precision we need for, for this, you know, um, this problem. Uh, there's lots of closed source codes that people are all using individually. And we're going to do a bunch of statistics to fit models to data because that's my specialty. Mm. I right. fit models to data about stellar flares in Kepler and TESS, these, these telescopes. And so um, I was interested in doing the same for this. Um, and, yeah, we, we found some interesting results. We were able to time these relative to the solar cycle because you can see the solar cycle shows up in, in these data because you get this 11-year cycle which gives you um, when the sun is at maximum activity, its magnetic field is big and strong, big spatially and strong in intensity, and that shields us from cosmic rays. And when hmm. it's at its minimum in activity, we get more cosmic rays because the shielding's off. And, and so, you can actually see that yeah, in the yeah. tree rings. You can see you the cycle. You get wow. wiggle. It's really cool. And so um, we looked for that and we tried to pick that very faint wiggle up and see where the, the spikes came in relation to that. Now, I actually had been pretty confident we were going to see that these all arrived at solar maximum because, you know, the leading theory was that these are solar flares you get big solar flares four times more often at solar maximum than at minimum. We, we actually found that they arrived one at maximum, one at minimum, and one halfway between. It's a bit weird. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also found that a couple of these events lasted longer than a year. So you've got time resolution of about a year with tree rings, six months if you've got northern and southern hemisphere trees of different species, different growing seasons. But a couple of these looked like they took 12, 18 months. One took three years. We couldn't, we couldn't get the carbon cycle to be slow enough to make that rise. The production had to be prolonged. So maybe this was one thing that lasted a while, 
or maybe it was a sequence of super flares. You don't really expect that because um, there's no correlation other than the solar cycle, to my knowledge, and to Matthew Owens, who's, who's actually works on this. We published a paper earlier in the year. There's no correlation in time other than the solar cycle in the arrival of the biggest flares that we see today. So it'd be weird to get a big sequence of huge flares all back to back for a couple of years. That that would be very, very unusual. Um, we don't know what it is, honestly. Mm. Um, so, like, what other ways can you corroborate this? I mean, you, you've yeah. checked it against the solar cycle, but I, I there's got to be other mm -hmm. creative ways that you can search for anything else that could tell you what's going on here. Ice cores. So, mm -hmm. you just get radiocarbon, which is locked in tree rings, because remember, the issue is not whether it produces something that affects the Earth, but whether it produces something that you can then register precisely in time. Mm-hmm. The so tree rings are good. Ice cores, you also get an annual snow season in places like Greenland or Antarctica, but then get compacted into glaciers. So if you take a glacial core and you measure the composition of that, you can get also a signal of this. Now, it's not radiocarbon that we worry about there. The same high-energy particles produce different nuclear reactions that give you chlorine-36, beryllium-10, um, and they, what's really cool about them there's no carbon cycle for them. They, they, they just get rained out pretty quickly. Um, and so that's what I was doing visiting ANSTO, uh, the nuclear facility south of Sydney, is they were doing not just radiocarbon measurements, but also um, chlorine, 10, uh, chlorine 36 brilliant 10 measurements of ice cores from Antarctica. They've got one of the world's biggest ice core laboratories. Uh, we do a lot of Antarctic research. In Australia. And, and so, I'm yeah. assuming somebody has already searched for these cycles in yeah. ice cores in the past. Oh, yeah. it, do they see them? But, so there's been some great measurements by um, Florian McCaldy's team at Greenland ice cores. Um, what we're hoping is that, yeah, you see them. Um, what we're hoping is to get better high resolution timing of these events. See, do you see a long duration? You know, is there structure there? Is, is this more than one event? in the Antarctic ice cores with the, with the big machine at Ansto, um, I am under the impression the answer is going to be yes. I think that, that it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting um, what they actually find when they've done the full analysis um, uh, of both chlorine and beryllium. Um, uh, Andrew Smith from Ansto told the ABC in an interview that, that he thinks that our result, that the, you know, the event has ended, is, is, is going to pan out. Right. And so yeah. astrophysically speaking, when you yeah. think about what happens when a solar huh. flare is giving off material and yeah. you compare that to what a gamma ray burst might be, would you expect a different cascade of particles between yeah. a solar flare hitting the atmosphere? The yeah. So you, would, yeah. would you see something different, do you think? One of the clinches for the idea that this is a solar flare is you get a different proportion of carbon, beryllium, and chlorine radioisotopes produced by different high energy particles of different energies. And um, the ratio of chlorine and beryllium, as measured by Florian McCaldy's team, um, indicates that it's got a similar spectrum to solar high energy particles uh, and not to gamma ray bursts. Um, um, I'm, I'm very curious what, what um, more data from Florian's team and more data from, from Antarctica as well as Greenland is going to say at high precision because I really want to know the answer to this. Um, yeah, so that, that it's currently consistent with the sun. But so it's, it's a little unclear, though, why you would get this prolonged production. Maybe it's not prolonged production. Maybe it's something about the growth seasons of trees that we have wrong. If simply, uh, we did our best. Um, but maybe they're taking in sugars from over, over the course of a couple of years. We don't, we don't think that's the case. Uh, I've talked to Ulf about this, that dendrochronologists are pretty confident about when the carbon gets laid down, but there are some uncertainties. Um, it could be something to do with the weather. It could be something to do with the global circulation of, of the atmosphere, um, putting some carbon in some places, some in others, because actually the data from a couple of years sort of inconsistent with each other in, in exactly the timing. Um, and so it could be something to do with the weather. It, it, there's no sort of spatial pattern that we get in the inconsistent day. So we'd expect something like that. To be Have spatial. you thought about lunar yeah. samples? Trouble is how you get annual samples from the moon. That's the yeah. trouble. 
Yeah. So the, so there's a, there's a paper that I read a couple of years ago that that if you actually do a core sample from the moon, mm. you pretty much get a historical record of every single astrophysical mm. event that's happened in the universe for as far back as you can take the core. Yeah. You're going to get every solar flare. You're going to get every nearby gamma ray burst, every supernova event, et cetera. And it's not going to be polluted by stupid Earth life. Oh. It's going to be it's going to be space itself. Um, and obviously, but, that would be very tricky to to find that stuff because it's going to be <laughs> layered down in the regolith and it needs to be stored. Um, the, the, the trouble is, it's it's going to be very hard to identify exactly which year the regolith comes from, right? So um, people have done sediments on Earth to try and look for supernova millions of years ago and start looking for unusual radioisotopes. And there's been some really cool results that way. But with, with the trouble with rocks, right, is the rocks don't know what year it is. If there's not something like um, a, a weather season in Antarctica or a growth season for you to give you an exact chronology, um, you can see all sorts of radioisotopes in the moon. But you won't be able to say this happened in 774 AD. I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure they don't have that kind of timing precision. Um, say this happened in this particular year. And I'd look into it just because I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the proposal was that that you could pull core samples and you could oh, yeah. it backwards in time. So it would be interesting to see. Like maybe it's the solar cycle. Like there's something about oh, the yeah. solar cycle laying down uh, some kind it, of. It could be right. Yeah, it, yeah. It would be really awesome um, if they could send me up to do that science. Yeah, uh, so I, all you got to do is just get a nice core sample from the moon that right. nobody's ever done. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's all. Okay. Um, so yeah. I guess, what do you think this tells us about the the environment that we find ourselves in? I mean, I think we have this nagging suspicion that the yeah. universe is trying to kill us. As you start to uh, see these kinds of catastrophic events in the tree ring data, what does that tell you about our place in the universe, do you think? Um, I think the universe doesn't really care about us. Um, I think what's interesting is um, we're much more vulnerable now than we've ever been to this kind of threat. Uh, you know, like, for example, the, the previous events, like 993 AD, 774 AD are the most recent ones. There are no historical records of an effect on the Earth, there's, there's an ambiguous uh, mention of a red crucifix in the sky in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for the year 774 AD. But this was written by, like, medieval monks. Everything looks like a crucifix to them. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Right. You know, yeah. um, well, they saw something in the sky maybe, but uh, no contemporary people in, like, China or Arabia really made unambiguous discussions of what that was either. So this wasn't something that blew people's minds enough to write about. The effects that it had in that year. But the Carrington event was, yeah. because I know that people yeah. even near the equator were able to see crazy auroras. Yeah. yeah. And so um, other than aurorae, I don't think people would have seen a lot. But what the Carrington event, right, people had magnetometers, people had telegraph poles, stuff like that. And then you start to see it having effects on infrastructure. But, you know, telegraph was new. It wasn't like a huge deal. Um, it didn't set us back for forever. But now we live in this extremely complex, interconnected world where, you know, the entire global economy and society is electronic. Um, I'm, you know, I've got concerns. If, if a huge solar flare hit us today, um, that, would, that would be very helpful. And we've got to move ahead for that. Uh, we've got to be really carefully. But we've also got to understand, like, what are these Miyake events? Are they, in fact, single super flares, or is it a period of many super flares, some kind of unknown solar physics at an extreme um, solar solar activity? Or is it some kind of, like, for example, some of the, you see also these grand solar minima show up where the sun's magnetic field shuts off for years, and you get a prolonged moderate rise in radio carbon. Mm. And uh, the shortest one of these that's been unambiguously called a grand solar minimum, it's about 10 years long which is really only one solar cycle, it just vanishes. So uh, that was discovered also by Fusumiyaki uh, in 5480 BC, I want to say. So is this maybe the extreme short end of the distribution of extreme solar shutoff? It's not really clear to me. It's not really like, I don't think any of the existing theories on what these are really fully replicate the data. And we're going to have to do a combination of better modeling of the carbon cycle and, and the weather and the atmosphere, right? 
We've also a better understanding of tree rings and ice cores, like what was the weather in Antarctica like? What was the weather in Greenland like? We've also more data. Like, I know it's a boring scientist thing to say of like, oh, I don't really know the answer. We need more data. But like, right. now, frankly, this that's, is... That's fine. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, oh, I mean, oh, we know, yeah. we know yeah. that like M dwarves can have... Yeah. Solar flares that are hundreds of thousands of times more powerful than anything the sun can yeah. unleash. And we have, but but with main sequence stars, G-type stars like with the sun, yeah. I know there's a lot of those flares captured in, say, Kepler data, test data. There's a lot of things that are watching the brightness of stars. Do you see the kinds of events yeah. that you might expect had, had hit the Earth in other stars at a level of frequency that tells you, okay, these are happening out there. Like this is the kind of thing that the sun can do 80 times worse than the Carrington event. It's not clear. So one of the interesting things is M dwarf flares aren't actually bigger than G dwarf flares. They're just relatively bigger compared to the M dwarfs quite weak luminosity. So you get, um, you get big flares on G dwarfs too. What's, What's quite interesting is all of the flares seen by Kepler or Tess on other stars, the energies of those flares would be enormous super flares compared to the sun's flares, right? Simply because of the sensitivity threshold of Kepler and Tess. You don't see them unless they're really big. So, so the smallest flares you can see with Kepler are the biggest flares you can see on the sun. Nearly everything is a super flare, really, um, which is quite interesting. And so we know that super flares are really big on other stars. But here's the catch. The sun doesn't do this very often because the sun is a relatively old G dwarf. So um, these, these stars are born rapidly rotating. With, you know, the rotation is driving the strong magnetic dynamo. Uh, this magnetic dynamo actually magnetizes its wind, which carries away some of the rotational energy. And so these stars are born fast rotators, which are very magnetically active, and they spin down over time. And so they reach a critical level where the dynamo changes, when the rotation speed and the convection speed are, are turn out to be similar. It's called the Rossby number of one. So, uh, and then they change type of dynamo and they have that sort of old slow dynamo, right? What's really interesting is the sun is atypical of G-dwarfs that you see in the sky, in the sense that it's actually undergoing this transition at the moment. So the sun has this, this intermediate level of rotation where it's neither super old one which is really really slow and magnetically inactive nor a young one which is very fast and magnetically active so the fast magnetically active ones are the ones that give you these super flares most of the time so the funny thing is it's hard to extrapolate from kepler what we should expect to see on the sun because the sun's dynamo is not typical of the stars that we see flaring in kepler I, I wonder uh, how much of a coincidence or how useful it is. I mean, the sun, by having a relatively high level of activity, it's pushing out the heliosphere that is blocking a lot of that cosmic rays and probably yeah. protecting life here on Earth. But the yeah. price we pay is every now and the sun oh, smacks yeah. us with yeah. its more powerful solar flares as well because it still hasn't fully matured. That's really interesting. Yeah, lots of people do these simulations of how much UV and X-rays and high-energy particles do you need to be good for you in order to produce enough mutations to start doing, you know, evolution, start producing abiogenesis and stuff before it starts to be really bad for you. And, you know, I think a lot of the consensus is emerging, and I've, I've worked a lot on this in the sense of radio observations of M-dwarfs trying to study this. That's my bread and butter science. Um, it seems that M-dwarfs are pretty bad for you, that... Uh, if in order to be in the habitable zone of an M dwarf, you have to be really close to it. Uh, when you get a flare on an M dwarf, the biggest flares on M dwarfs are about as big as the biggest flares on G dwarfs, but you're a hell of a lot closer. And these can be very dangerous. You might even be actually magnetically connected to the M dwarf, um, is what some of our radio observations are showing. That's really bad for you because then you have no magnetosphere to protect you. You're just getting yeah. the wind dumped onto you. Yeah, so concentrated you at you. Yeah. M dwarfs are terrifying. Uh, very easily in the way that G dwarfs are. Yeah. But it's yeah. unclear what, what the details of you know, the dynamos of young G dwarfs, how they influence habitability. It's, it's a really exciting sort of question. So it really sounds like we need a survey 
like Kepler, not necessarily looking for planets, although I guess they're one and the same, oh, but yeah. really to scan really subtle changes in brightnesses of stars to try and get a sense of yeah. what level of solar activity out there is is normal. What would be really cool is blue or ultraviolet Kepler. Uh, if because um, flares are hotter than stars, so their spectrum is bluer, and mm. in fact gives you a lot of UV. And so the contrast of flares is much, much higher at, sh at bluer wavelengths, UV wavelengths, than it is at red wavelengths where Kepler and Tess are operating. So that would be pretty cool. If you wanted to do a big flare survey with a big blue camera, I'd love that. Has that anyone is, proposed that? Is, are there any missions in the works yeah. for that? Yeah. Now, um, Fraser, it's been a really great chat. Yeah, I yeah. Have to my next thing. Yeah, no problem. So if people want to find out more, follow your work, what's the best place to yeah. do that? Twitter, Fringe Tracker on Twitter. I'm quite yeah. active. Twitter dies in the next few weeks, thanks to Elon. <laughs> My God. Um, Otherwise, just archive, I guess. Yeah, email me at the University of Queensland. I'm happy to take Wonderful. questions. All right, well, Benjamin, absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so Great. much. You. Good luck. And uh, if you do figure this out, let me know. Thanks. All right, take I'll care. see you Bye-bye. Bye. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the master of the universe level. All your support means the universe to us.